Hi, my name is Lalda Nusman. I'm going to be reading from my two poetry collections, starting with The Kitchen Dweller's Testimony. Um, and so I tried to choose poems that are a bit warmer and a bit more tender and have moments of just unloosing or freedom because of, um, you know, this difficult moment that we're in. And um, so the first poem is one from really just watching all the different kinds of birds in Austin, Texas, and taking time with their calls and how they seem to have so much desire, whether they were just kind of like in the neighborhood trees or um, at this bizarre peacock garden, um, or, you know, and especially the regular birds that would steal people's lunches and just kind of chase people around campus, I think were probably the most interesting to me because uh, I like the idea of desire being something that's ugly and just wanting to do something and trying to do something and it's not really recognized um, inside of the beauty that it's operating in. And so this is uh, for the woman whose love is a bird of passage. I am so poor before you, a grackle whose colors are as good as a peacock's sometimes better in the full face of sun. The love poem I meant to say is lost. Instead, I swear an oath. I curse like someone speaking in a foreign language. Instead of leave, I say scourge. The proper word, a chick's voice still in its egg, a beak in a small crack. Your blood is hot and flowing and the hinges of your heart's valves allow traffic in all your heart's rooms. Is that why the little kisses are not enough? In your sigh, there's the sound of water pouring into a hot, empty kettle. Let us have the same dream tonight, I say, and your smile is red glass in dim light. I dream my front tooth is a crumbling pillar and you are the entire city of sin in collapse. Instead of leave, you say raise. You are so poor before me. So let us paint the ocean instead. We dip the brushes in a canvas that takes them out of our hands. Now you are the grackle's tail, calling for eyes from the side of the road, and I am the best room in your heart. Um, and so this next poem is probably written in the same season and has some of the same themes. It was after years of uh, super high temperatures and um, difficulties with water management. Um, this is still in Austin, Texas, and uh, the animals kind of acting strangely. And finally, in the spring of 2010, the slow budding and the slow greening of the city and things starting to return to normal as the temperatures dropped and there was a bit more rainfall, um, which is, you know, not to be obvious, but a really magical time uh, to write in. The man who puts dirt on his head. I till you my garden. I remove weeds from you and only hesitate when the birds share an especially sweet note. I wonder if the lesser plants clinging to your earth have a right to it. I pull arms from bases when they reach out to a neighbor for help. I observe the milk they produce when choked and deny them offspring. They used to have a right to your earth when you did not understand how birdsong swells in the cathedral of a tree, how a person can leave a life on the kitchen table, how need is most powerful before dawn, death's popular hour. This dirt will not cool you. I remove the weeds and leave the wildflower. I take the excess and place it on my own head. Who turns the earth? Who is the garden? In the days when butterflies and beetles escort us in our work, we are both water and wind, 
seed and petal, farmer and the earth that resists, relents. We remove the uninvited worms, how their color reminds us of the private places, how they cling to the roots of anything. Um, and I just remembered as I was reading that, uh, that I had heard this narration about uh, the daughter um, of the prophet, peace be upon him, Fatima, I think it was, who was, uh, she was so fiery and feisty that sometimes her husband would become so frustrated that he would just put dirt on top of his head to cool down. And I like to imagine the idea of this like revered, you know, figure, his daughter being so uh, herself, despite, you know, what's expected of her. Uh, okay. I'm reading fast as hell. <laughs> um, okay. So the last poem I'll read from this book, um, when I was writing it, I really knew that it was going to come toward the end of the collection and that I had to be able to speak to my exhaustion and a sense of lack um, and a, a sense of lack that was so um, probably profound at the time that I couldn't even recognize that I was lacking things that I just felt so uncomfortable with myself and thinking about what kind of woman I wanted to be at the time I was finishing grad school and um, wasn't sure um, of myself in writing and in poetry and so I wanted to think about um, a ritual and think about all the different rituals that appear in storytelling and scriptures, and they often have to do with women carrying, which is, of course, a very, um, you know, it's a super translatable metaphor for the things that we're uh, trying to walk through and the ways that we need people to help us carry um, the things that are almost too much to manage, but then we just kind of barely make it. And so this is water. I came to you carrying water. I came to you carrying silted water from a well, muddied, carried in a bucket with a split lip. My water tasted salty and like the earth and so like blood and I brought as much as I could carry in a bucket that drooled tiny streams of water on my mud ashen legs. In all our days together, I have walked between well and house enough so the path is marked with the branching roads of my souls. I have come to you so often, the path has many other roads if only you kneel in the dust and look for them. I am subject to you in the way the water is subject to the moon. You are subject to me in the way a wall is subject to its roof. And like the earth, I expect you to come upon me of a sudden, like flesh out of a slit in cloth. And like the wall, you expect intimate collapses, capillaries of change inscribed day by day on our surfaces. I came to you with water from my deep well. I came to you with earth for your ready water, water in every crevice for the valley that divides your tongue. I held your head in my lap and traveled the many roads leading out of that valley. Okay, let's switch books. Um, I'm reading now from Exiles of Eden, and I chose this poem just in recognition of, you know, the first couple and the first people that had to deal with extreme isolation um, and what it means to figure yourself out and figure out the world around you while trying to walk through that. Uh, sympathy for Eve. I wake with my right ankle in my right hand, my right wrist in my left hand, a tender one-sided crucifixion, 
pinning myself to sheets that seem wet, 5 a.m., always 5 a.m., and this time I think there are dozens of dead bees bundled in the sheets, their thoraxes and wings wet. With what? Not even the air is moist. Not even my hairline now that I've shaved my temples and nape so I won't feel a man's hands in that hair. The way he turned from me is so far outside my narrative. I decided to consider Eve the weight of what she could sense but never witness. Complete devastation. Bees and all their companions. Everything in the archive of Earth. Damp and beyond resurrection, her foresight my only understanding for the total dread I feel against my arid longing. That there are not even bees, nothing but my belly against my thigh. I imagine Eve, her automatic credibility, her logic not yet accidental, no one to review evidences against her, no one to collect her papers, then read them generations later, saying she lied. She was kind and not exacting at all. She wrote dozens of letters to Satan asking after his heart under the pressure of his choices. I consider Eve and the first time Adam turned from her. After some argument that certainly involved naming, valuing, what it was for someone to spend a night truly lonely while not alone, his sleeping back to her and her saying, well, I have my own two arms and the faculty to catalog. Tonight is the first night one hand held tight the other. Or the first time Adam attempted to lead her down a path and she insisted it was a gorge, its bottom, water, and snakes and she sat right where she'd been standing until the sun set. By that time, she'd seen enough refusals to know how to sit on sediment. Or, the first time her very eyes were a seasonal path, restricted by vines and branches hard to strip or snap, and her pupil said, you may not enter until the ground has thawed. Adam paused and measured the snow at his feet, or the first time she was in his arms, dizzy from too much sleep, and relaxed further into him, laid into him. We are not a biological imperative. We were joined by the impulse for story. <laughs> it's like, really sucks to be in a tense situation during this, uh quarantine like be fighting with someone that's just like posted up in the house is like what that poem made me think of um another thing that I was thinking of when I was writing that poem is how um people have such a limited perspective um on on women's voices and women's lives um and women narrator narrators that things could be about um like in that poem I was thinking about climate change I was thinking about loneliness in the modern era. I was thinking about how part of what the law is and how the law constructed is constructed is just to kind of like limit uh, what women are doing and then how we're blamed for that as if we just want to have small stories and, and small lives and just be preoccupied, um, you know, with what other people are up to or what men are up to and uh, about romance or something as if romance itself is anyways not like political and doesn't speak to archetypes and isn't about so much more than just one um, or more bodies up to something. Um, so I wrote this next poem during uh, a time in Chicago when, you know, the weather was behaving a bit strangely. I think this was probably like 2015 or something. Um, and there were a couple of bees that were just living in my house. I don't know um, where they came from and I tried to urge them but they didn't want to leave and so um, I started to try and imagine what they could be thinking um, and what they could be wanting um, and you know they're such an obvious marker for the world as it rapidly and disastrously shifts and are such a reminder for for care, to just be careful um, of the living things that are around us. 
And so I think people understand this to be um, a certain kind of love poem, but, you know, I think that in the book you'll see that there are a lot of love poems for water being in the places where it's not supposed to and for um, these bees that are um, under pressure um, and that are, you know, in their own uh, pain and possibly confusion because of our actions. So, the bees gospel. I enter a household wherein a woman uses stamps with blooms, zinnia, aster, primrose. She adorns envelopes, remembers her mother's destroyed marigolds and grieves for them again. At night, a man puts his palm on her temple, then her crown, unfolding meadows and every fruit and root. I sit on the headboard and wait for permission to enter. It is an expanding paradise. Everything knows its relationship to light, to darkness, pursues various means to the same ends, and his hand contains the aliving spice of a room full of palms. He tells her she is the seasons. He pursues a single lyric, wears several musks at once. In the morning, she splits a dense fruit. Within it are chambers, combs. She extracts seeds on the table, spends songs cleaning them. My guardian waits outside the window. I like how this man looks when he offers things. Every object, a gift, cup, Washcloth, his scented chest and temples. I don't know which one is the queen, so I fly between them both. And the backs of their necks are the same. They are mirrors facing each other across a well-lit room. I am in a frenzy. I visit a cup whose color I can't resist. Summer sky after three nights without rain. It contains a sweet fluid. I don't know the name of this nectar. It causes me to forget. I have to be near it, on his knuckles, on his shoulders. What does it want, she asks. It doesn't know, he says. What does it know of what humans made? Then let him go and tell the others. Let him recite. They try to kill me, not sincerely. I drop from ceiling to floor until they too are exhausted. She opens a window. I stay parsed their fragrances as she parsed those seeds. I want him to lie with her again, show me multitudinous gardens. My attendant can wait no longer. I salute her bare right breast and watch her skin prickle and her scalp flush and fly out. And so this is a section, um, I'll just read the last section from the last poem in this book, Refusing Eurydice. We refuse death by spells. We refuse death by attack. We refuse death by falling, and we refuse death in depressions. We refuse the spirits that attempt oppression, and we refuse the spirits that attempt possession. We refuse humans who call themselves gods, who try to graft hellfire onto our bodies, and raise columns of fire in our yards. We are looking for better myths. We are tired of falling and finding ourselves underfoot. We are searching the earth for images that draw parables. We left the serpents underfoot in peace and refuse their bites. We refuse death by discourse. We refuse death by exile. We refuse death by falling and we refuse death in depressions. We are looking for a better myth. We've only been looking since Eve.